Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar, Medicare Payment Reform, Lessons Learned and Considerations for the Future. I am Sarah Dash, President and CEO of the Alliance for Health Policy. For those who are not familiar with the Alliance, welcome. We are a nonpartisan resource for the health policy community dedicated to advancing knowledge and understanding of health policy issues. The Alliance gratefully acknowledges Arnold Ventures for their support of today's webinar. And today we're pleased to have Erica Socker with us. She is the Vice President of Healthcare and Payer Reform at Arnold Ventures, and she's going to come on and provide some brief opening remarks. Erica, welcome. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you to the Alliance for Health Policy team for putting together this event. Welcome to everyone joining us virtually today. For those of you who aren't familiar with Arnold Ventures, we're a philanthropy focused on addressing pressing domestic policy problems with evidence-based solutions. Our health policy work aims to make healthcare in America more affordable. And for us, that means more affordable for consumers, for businesses, and for taxpayers. So there is overwhelming evidence that we're not getting sufficient value for the healthcare dollars that we're spending. And one reason for this is that the typical way we pay for care does not support efficient care delivery. The traditional fee-for-service payment system where we pay by the service or by the procedure creates incentives to provide more care, some of which is unnecessary, and to provide care in higher cost settings in some cases. This leads to higher healthcare costs. But, but even beyond the cost implications, it also carries risks for patients, both potential health risks from inappropriate care and also the risk of exposure to higher out-of-pocket costs. Effective value-based payments can help counter the incentives that are inherent in fee-for-service. Typically, these models hold providers accountable for the total cost and quality of care, for example, for a population of beneficiaries or for a particular clinical episode. These models have the potential to encourage providers to deliver care more efficiently. We've made some progress transitioning from fee-for-service to value-based payment, and some models such as accountable care organizations show real promise. But we need to do more work to strengthen the most promising models and to increase their adoption throughout the healthcare system. Today's event will hopefully give you a sense of what we've learned about alternative payment models over the past decade plus. And, and, and in addition to that, I also hope that you're able to walk away with some concrete ideas for how federal policymakers can really help accelerate the transition to models that will constrain costs while also improving quality and equity, both in Medicare, but also system-wide. And so with that, I'll turn it back to Sarah so that we can get to our great group of panelists. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Erica. And now we'll go over some very quick housekeeping items and then we'll go ahead and introduce our panel. Um, you can remind, I wanna remind everybody that you can join our conversation on Twitter using the hashtag AllHealthLive, join our community at AllHealthPolicy as well as on Facebook and LinkedIn. We want you all to be active participants, so please get your questions ready and send them in um, at any time throughout the broadcast. You'll see a dashboard on the right-hand side of your web browser. There's a speech bubble icon with with a question mark, go ahead and submit your questions there, uh, as well as if you have any tech issues that you're experiencing, somebody will try to help you. Be sure to check out our website, allhealthpolicy.org, where you can find background materials, including a resource list and an expert list, should you have follow-up questions, as well as a recording of today's webinar and uh, the slide deck that will be made available there soon. So now, uh, the moment you've been waiting for, I am so pleased to be joined today by uh, a truly esteemed group of experts. First, uh, we have Jennifer Padulka, who is a senior consultant at the national healthcare consulting firm, Health Management Associates. Jennifer is a researcher, strategist, and policy advisor with extensive data analysis and project management expertise. Much of her work has focused on physician payment policy, traditional Medicare, Medicare Advantage, Part D, CMS innovation models, as well as the broader healthcare system context for Medicare policy. Next, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Michael Chernew, who is the Leonard D. Schaefer Professor of Healthcare Policy and the Director of Healthcare Markets and Regulation Lab at Harvard Medical School. He's also the Chairman of MedPAC. Dr. Chernew's research examines several areas related to improving the healthcare system, including studies of novel benefit designs, Medicare Advantage, alternative payment models, low value care, and the causes and consequences of rising healthcare spending. 
And finally, we're so pleased to be joined today by Dr. Mai Pham. Dr. Pham is the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Institute for Exceptional Care, a new nonprofit organization dedicated to helping people with intellectual and developmental disabilities thrive. Dr. Pham is a general internist and a national health policy leader. Prior to the Institute for Exceptional Care, she was Vice President at Anthem Inc., responsible for value-based care initiatives. And prior to that, she served as the Chief Innovation Officer at the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, where she was a founding official and the architect of Medicare's foundational programs on accountable care organizations and primary care. So we have a fantastic lineup today. We're going to launch today's discussion by hearing from Jennifer Padilka. So Jennifer, let me turn it over to you to give us an overview of uh, where we are with Medicare um, payment reform and uh, value-based payment. Jennifer. Thanks very much, Sarah. It's um, a pleasure to join everyone today. Um, and really looking forward to exploring where we've come on Medicare payment reform and where we're going. Um, I'm here to kick off on the where we've been. So if we could jump to the next slide, please. And the next one after that. And I thought I would bore everyone right off the start with a bar chart. Um, but this bar chart shows something really important about why Medicare is so interested in payment reform and why we're here today. Um, let me orient you to what these data show. First, the numbers above each bar indicate the average spending growth for that decade. And you'll note that, of course, these growth numbers fluctuate a lot decade to decade. The bars are really different. But that growth rate has always outpaced inflation, which brings us to our current predicament, where the Medicare Part A trust fund is projected to be depleted very soon. We don't know exactly when, it'll be 2026 according to last year's trustees report or perhaps 2027 according to CBO's most recent data. Um, but it's important to note that the other parts of Medicare, not just Part A, um, they don't face the same newsworthy depletion date, but they do share in spending growth that is exceeding funding sources and putting strains on taxpayers and the entire system. Next system, uh, next system, next slide, please. Um, so Medicare, pretty much from the beginning has addressed spending growth through different ways that have really evolved over time. Um, so part of that high spending growth that we saw on the previous slide for the 1980s was rooted in how the Medicare system got started. It was enacted in 1965 and underway the next year. The program opted to adopt payment tools that were largely used by commercial insurance plans at the time. This meant that hospitals were paid on the basis of their costs and physicians were paid on the basis of their fees. As one probably could have predicted, of course, of course, growth ensued from this um, approach. Then in 1983, Medicare adopted the inpatient prospective payment system to pay for hospital services. The IPPS basically pays a fixed per discharge rate for all services for a hospital stay. And this was revolutionary compared to paying based on cost. In fact, the IPPS launched additional payment systems for outpatient hospital services, inpatient psychiatric and rehab facilities, long-term care hospitals, home health, SNFs, and others. Um, and innovation in prospective payment systems continues today. The Impact Act of 2014 required MedPAC to study a unified post-acute care payment system, which would pay a similar rate across all those different post-acute care settings. And in fact, the commission voted in favor of this option in 2016. We're still waiting for that to be rolled out within the Medicare program. Uh, the next big change occurred in 1992 when physician fees based on um, reported fees were replaced with a new fee schedule. The fee schedule is essentially, again, a catalog of fixed rates, in this case, for every single service that a clinician could provide and bill the program for. Um, and then finally, um, the ACA passed in 2010, which included the culmination of some new payment reforms, such as Medicare Shared Savings Programs and Accountable Care organiza Organizations. And of course, it established the new Innovation Center. Next slide, please. Um, so we're gonna start with the Medicare Shared Savings Program. It's a voluntary opportunity for groups of physicians, hospitals, and other healthcare providers to come together to form accountable care organizations or ACOs. Uh, the first cohort of ACOs actually got started in 2012. So the program has grown considerably since then and been operating for just under a decade. 
Most recently in 2021, there are 477 MSSP ACOs. Oh, I'm sorry, we have jumped a slide. Um, if we could go back one slide, please. And we're missing, okay, never mind, slide's missing. Um, so I'll make sure I get all the points in. Uh, there are 477 MSSP ACOs serving over 10 million beneficiaries. Um, that 10 million beneficiaries represents about 17% of total Medicare beneficiaries, but it's actually greater when you look at just those who are in the traditional fee-for-service program. Uh, membership in MSSP ACOs accounts for about 40% of all beneficiaries who are in fee-for-service. The various MSSP ACOs are spread throughout the country, but they're not available in every market yet. In 2020, MSSP ACOs earned performance payments or shared savings that totaled $2.3 billion, while saving the Medicare program $1.9 billion. This made it the fourth consecutive year of net savings for Medicare. So uh, going back almost a decade, that means it did take several years for MSSP to grow to be a success, and part of the reason both for the success and the time it took us to get here is risk. MSSP offers dif different participation tracks that allow ACOs to assume various levels of risk, starting with one-sided, where there's an opportunity for shared savings, but no risk of shared loss, uh, moving up to some fairly robust shared savings and shared loss or, or two-sided risk. Most recently for 2010, uh, two thirds of MSSP ACOs shared savings with CMS, um, but this differed by risk. So those in the two-sided risk arrangement, 88% shared risk, and those who were still doing sort of the one-sided early risk model, only about half of those shared in that savings. Okay, so we're going to uh, now move to the next slide, which shows the four circles. Yes, thanks. Um, and look at what the CMS Innovation Center has done. Again, this was established by the ACA. And according to that statute, the Innovation Center is tasked with testing models to determine if they reduce spending without reducing quality of care or improve quality of care without increasing spending. The Innovation Center has tested or is in the process of testing 172 models that include Medicare. I want to note that a lot of others, including CMS, report uh, a total number of 50 some odd models. Um, ours is different because the other groups report the count of models in aggregate uh, for two large efforts that awarded models to more than 100 applicants. Those include the Healthcare Innovation Awards and the State Innovation Models. Collectively, those two efforts ran from 2012 through 2019, and they included some really interesting models, such as the Medicare Diabetes Prevention Program, which successfully was introduced to the uh, full Medicare program. There were some additional healthcare innovation award models that both saved money and improved quality that have not been yet introduced to the Medicare program nationwide. Some of these focused on cancer care, care for uh, patients with Alzheimer's and dementia, and one focused on avoiding hospitalizations for Medicare beneficiaries in long-term care settings. In addition to the MDPP model, three other models so far have successfully um, either saved money or improved quality. The home health value-based purchasing was just approved earlier this year. Pioneer ACOs were approved a few years ago, um, and elements of Pioneer ACOs were included in one of the tracks for the Medicare Shared Savings Programs. And then our fourth approved model, which is a mouthful, is basically a prior authorization program for recurring non-emergency ambulance services. It's recently been improved and will be rolled out in the program from 2021 through 2022. It's important to note that these four models tested some really different payment reform ideas, and all four of these ideas are now part of the traditional Medicare program. Uh, next slide, please. Which brings us to where we are today. Um, earlier this month, incoming CMS leadership published a healthcare affair blog indicating some key takeaways from the past, such as their findings that mandatory participation in financial incentives um, can help to ensure that meaningful provider participation really takes place in models. And second, they found that providers have reported finding it challenging to accept downside risk where they're at risk for losses if they do not have tools to enable and empower changes in care delivery. Uh, the group also noted plans for the future of the Innovation Center, such as making equity for all beneficiaries a centerpiece of every model and not 
separating it into individual models. They also plan to focus on launching fewer models, taking to heart a recent uh, recommendation from MedPAC. And then third, they acknowledge the burden of out-of-pocket costs and, and uh, signal their intent to look for ways to lower that uh, cost burden. Currently, there are 28 models underway. If we can jump to the next slide. And these 28 models are arranged into seven categories that are assigned by the Innovation Center. Uh, the seventh one is not shown here on the screen because it focuses on Medicaid and CHIP. I've included examples under each of these. Um, and some of these models are pretty exciting. Um, so most recently, BIPSI, the Bundled Payments for Care Improvement Advanced Model, uh, the first year evaluation results just came back and found cost savings. This is particularly exciting because similar findings on, on savings weren't found for the initial BIPSI model, but what the Innovation Center has done is uh, revised methodology for some initial models and come back with an advanced or 2.0 version, and we're starting to see that approach pay off. Um, I'll also note the CGR model has been extended through 2024 and recently uh, completed a third year of evaluation. And then uh, if you look across on the screen under primary care transformation, um, I'm sorry, below on the screen uh, for global and professional direct contracting, this builds on elements of ACOs, even though it's not in the accountable care category. And it offers some really significant flexibility to primary care practices and other providers to tailor care to the unique needs of their patients. In fact, on the other side of the screen, under new payment and service delivery, there's a new model, geographic direct contracting, that is currently on pause while it's being reviewed. If it resumes with similar methodology, this would actually introduce some truly transformative ideas into Medicare, where organizations would build on ACO concepts to build organizations that uh, take responsibility for all Part A and Part B spending for every Medicare beneficiary in a market who hasn't enrolled in MA. So I'll leave you with this before I uh, uh, turn to my colleagues. Uh, these are some really exciting models happening across these ideas categories. And ideas in one category are at this point cross-fertilizing across other categories. ACO concepts are built into models in multiple categories. Um, and we look forward to seeing what some of those results are. Um, pass to my next uh, speaker, please. Great. Jennifer, thank you so much. That was a phenomenal presentation, and uh, we will get all of your slides up uh, on, on our website, including um, the one that I apologize that was missing. Um, so now I'm pleased to turn it over to Dr. Michael Chernu. Mike, go ahead. Sarah, thank you so much. I am thrilled to be here. Um, as Jennifer's talk illustrates, I always learn a ton from uh, being part of these panels, and so I am thrilled to be here. Um, I will just say I'm speaking in my role as a professor, not in my role as a MedPAC chair. Uh, so keep that in mind. Um, so I'm going to talk about the future of APMs, largely in the context of Medicare. So next slide. Um, let me just talk about sort of broad motivation, and at least for me, um, the notion is that there's a lot of inefficiencies in the Medicare program. We know that from work on geographic variation. We know that from work on low-value care and overuse. Um, I worry a lot about this going forward. There's a lot of services. Let's take telehealth, which is both very, very high value, but also has the potential uh, to be overused in a range of ways, and we really struggle with how to manage telehealth in a fee-for-service payment model. And there's a lot of work on uh, inefficient sites of care and site neutral type payment. Uh, Jennifer mentioned the post-acute care work. Um, if you listen to the MedPAC meeting coming up at the end of this week, we also have more post-acute care work thinking about uh, unifying the models. It's really hard to get a lot of this right in the way our siloed fee-for-service uh, fee schedules are set up. Next slide. Um, again, uh, because of these sort of siloed fee schedules, we find a lot of problems um, in use, and we think fee-for-service is sort of part of the reason why we see these inefficiencies. I, I will certainly say it's not the only reason, but we deal with them in very clunky ways. There's a bunch of caps, if you look at post-acute care policy, for example, of how long people can stay, how many sessions they can have, a bunch of other types of caps and other very clunky ways to deal with the inefficiencies. Um, the other thing I'll point out, which is only one bullet point, but I really would like to emphasize is, 
Current policy calls for subinflation growth in fee-for-service prices writ large. So in the macro mid system, fees are scheduled to grow below inflation for the next set of decades. In the, for facilities, the ACA put in place the productivity adjustment, which has fees growing lower than input costs. Um, so we have very low fee trajectories in current law. And so the question is, can we develop payment models that encourage efficient care delivery and support the delivery system without increasing spending relative to where we are current law? Next slide. Uh, next slide. So I'm going to talk about alternative payment models. The basic theory is that efficiency, which is really the only way out of our fiscal conundrum, requires flexibility in how inputs are used. That's a general economics point. If you were in Econ 101, someone will be talking about how you blend labor and capital. But Broadly speaking, uh, you become efficient when you use inputs more uh, efficiently. Um, in the healthcare sector, services, uh, inpatient admissions, offices, it's drugs, surgeries, diagnostic tests, all of those are inputs conceptually, and the output is actually health. So the core challenge here is can we set up payment models that encourage the flexibility to substitute the use of these inputs um, and allow providers to capture the gains from the efficiency? Um, so an example would be if we can get rid of a needless demo, uh, diagnostic test or use a, a lower cost but still high quality post-acute care setting, can we um, mix and match those inputs to reduce spending but get uh, same or even better outputs? That's sort of the goal. Um, next slide. So how we do that is complicated and one of the biggest challenges we deal with is this, these efficiencies when they get generated the question becomes, who's going to keep those savings? So I coined a term in a previous thing I wrote that waste is an asset. And so once the system becomes more efficient, how much of those savings go to the program? How much go to the uh, providers that are generating those savings? How much goes to hospitals, physicians, primary care doctors, specialists? This is a big issue in how one's evaluating and frankly the politics around all of these different models. Next slide. So MedPAC, um, last June, had a, uh, this June, a few months ago, had a recommendation that the uh, secretary should implement a more harmonized portfolio of fewer alternative payment models that are designed to work together to support the strategic objectives of reducing spending and improving quality. The key insight is, um, and Jennifer mentioned, there's a lot of models and um, the problem with them coming and going and being launched simultaneously is it's very hard to really engage the delivery system. There's a lot of effort met, spent choosing which models to join. There's a lot of concerns that some of the savings that is generated in one model get siphoned off and given to an uh, organization participating in another because there's overlap in how the models work. If people are, say, in an episode-based payment model and the population-based payment model, how does all of that work together? And the idea is instead of to think about each model and launching them, is to think about launching them as sort of a broader portfolio of models. Because if you have three models all evaluated against, say, placebo, essentially fee for service, and you adopt it all three, it's not clear you get the sum of all the results. Another way that I tend to say this is we may want to let a thousand flowers bloom, but we don't want to plant all the flowers in the same hole. And so thinking about them as a group of models and a collective payment system. I think is important. Next slide. So um, the idea again is to develop models uh, in a way that thinks about them together as opposed to developing them and uh, diffusing them in a way that is isolated. Um, think about how the models financial incentives are complementary with each other and they don't become diluted when combined. So for example, if you give all of the post-acute savings to a model focused on, focused on post-acute care, you're siphoning those savings away from population-based payment models. Whether you want to do that is unclear, it depends on the specifics, except you certainly need to be cognizant of that problem. And to the extent possible, the models could have more consistent features, how we set the spending targets, how we do attribution, and a bunch of things like that. And we're going to be working, again, I'm speaking as a professor, uh, but just so your audience knows, we will be working this cycle uh, in MedPAC to think through a lot of these issues. So I encourage people to join. Next slide. Um, so here's one possible vision. I will emphasize, again, this is a... Uh, Michael version. It is not something I'm necessarily advocating. It is just one possible way that this might all play out. So you can envision a multi-track APM model with low risk 
uh, programs for small physician groups, think CPC Plus, Jennifer mentioned some of those. You could think of high risk models for larger groups, think NextGen or Direct Contracting Global, things that bigger groups can be part of, and tracks in between. They don't all need to have downside risk, so we can discuss the role that downside risk plays. Um, Jennifer mentioned the importance of that in her talk. Episodes are unbelievably important. They need to be added strategically to these existing set of models or to the APM models. So in lower risk tracks, I think there's going to be a heavy reliance on um, episodes. In some of the higher risk tracks, you might allow the episodes to be added what I would call under the waterline, where the organization taking population-based risk can develop their own episode models and work with the organizations that they're um, aligned with. Um, I think we need to think a lot about participation incentives. Um, uh, Jennifer mentioned the blog um, from the CMS leadership. Um, strong participation incentives are important. That's my word. I'm not going to go so far as to say mandatory, but in any case, um, it's particularly important for high-risk tracks. Um, I think in the benchmark setting process, it's important to remove the uh, ratchet effect, which is the tendency to have benchmarks in the future go down if you're successful in the past. And I think you can do that through some administrative mechanisms and how benchmarks are set. But again, this is very much up for discussion. There's a lot of details that require refinement, how we deal with risk adjustment, how we deal with attribution, how we deal with uh, composition of ACOs or even an episode who's taking risk. There's a lot of nuances to actually how these things work that have to be um, built out. And um, again, equity is a fundamental uh, objective um, of how we do this. And I think you can deal with that through benchmark policy, risk adjustment issues, and performance measures. And I think we have a long way to go to make sure that as we move on this journey, um, we not only uh, create a fiscally sustainable healthcare system, um, that we make sure that we promote quality access and equity for all. And certainly we're going to keep those goals front and center um, in the MedPAC discussions and um, I think in where we're going. So I think that is my last slide. Let's see if I have any concluding slide, but there you go. That's the end, so I'm gonna turn it over now, I think, to Mai. Thank you so much, uh, Michael, that was, that was great. And Mai, let's hear from you. Thanks for joining. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Jennifer and Michael, for the, the tee up. So I'm batting cleanup, and I think it was my job to talk with you a little bit about Blue Sky, which Michael touched on, but also really to call to your attention issues that um, are on the margins historically of value-based payment discussions that I think really need to be more centralized. So next slide. Let's start by talking about disparities. I think it's a it's become a bit facile for us um, as commentators, as policymakers, to ask demand that uh, program directors take into account health disparities and how to reduce them. But you have to be confident in the mechanisms that you use to approach this problem. And to begin with, you need to kind of level set on what you mean by health disparities and what your focused areas really are. So let's make sure that um, between the legislative bodies, the executive branch, and, uh, and those working on the problems in the marketplace, that there's some agreement on what domains of health disparities we're talking about, um, whether it's uh, the intersections with race, ethnicity, disability, uh, rural location, or other um, factors. It's really important to level set on that because that will drive how you think about the resources you're gonna need to bring to bear and the metrics that you think about and the goals that you set. So it's also important to recognize that especially for racial ethnic disparities, there are several sources of disparities, right? There is, for example, what happens when a given provider treats different patients in different subgroups differently. I refer to that as within provider disparities. This is where um, the concept of having concordance between the race ethnicity of the clinician and the patient may lead to better outcomes. That is, that is where that comes into play. It comes into play in terms of uh, language access, for example, and other factors. And how you address that is you can actually um, measure the within provider variation in quality performance. And those kinds of performance metrics really focus attention on the within provider sources of disparities. 
However, we all know that there are other sources of disparities that don't have to do with how a given provider behaves, but rather to do with differences in the structural components of care delivery that happen for different subgroups and communities. Um, so healthcare, like education, like housing, is physically segregated. In Medicare, something like fewer than 10% of the primary care physicians care for over 80% of black Medicare beneficiaries. So care is quite segregated at baseline. If that's the case, then what we're looking for when we try to address structural sources of disparities are those factors that vary by location and by type of provider. And so when you, when you try to address those, then what you want to reach for are not performance metrics, right? Because um, not to pick on, on Mass General, but at Mass General, they could do great on the within provider performance metrics, but it doesn't, it doesn't solve the issue that they get much higher fees than um, you know, clinics in rural Massachusetts. So when you want to address structural sources of disparities, you have to turn to what I think of as pricing tools, right? And that's really um, things like how you set the spending benchmarks, how you do risk adjustment, the percent of savings that you offer an ACO or primary care group, the types of factors that affect the dollars per beneficiary that a clinical organization could stand to earn. That acknowledges geographic and other types of segregation and the disparities in the resources available to a given provider organization based on their payer mix, right? If you're in a wealthy suburb, you've got lots of commercial insurance and a lot more resources with which to hire extra nurse care managers, even if they spill over into your Medicare uh, work. So, um, so just keeping in mind that it's important to explicitly address within and between provider disparities. Next. And then it's important to remember that health disparities are driven really much more so by non-clinical factors than by clinical factors. And that doesn't take away from the, I think, appropriateness of holding healthcare providers accountable for health disparities, even when they have to reach out and think about how to find partners to address those non-clinical aspects of living. But it is an opportunity within value-based payment to acknowledge those factors, the social drivers of health, um, and, do, and to do so with policy levers that are completely within uh, CMS and other payers' um, milieu and authority to do. CMS in particular, you know, uh, MA plans already have the flexibility to offer in lieu of services through their supplemental benefits, but they don't have a huge incentive to do so. And, and making that expectation more explicit would be helpful. And it would be helpful to offer um, uh, traditional Medicare ACOs those kinds of flexibilities as well. Making it easier regulatory-wise to have to encourage both public and private investment in community infrastructure, things like addressing food deserts, things like having safety nets so that um, uh, people don't become socially isolated. Uh, social isolation is a stronger predictor of hospitalization than cardiac status, for example. Um, and most importantly, the, the uh, upper level level of coordination it would take across federal government to really think through creative ways to allow communities these solutions to address non-clinical social drivers of health really have to be community specific, but allowing those communities to blend and braid various financing and payment streams would open up a lot more possibilities. And then not least, it's important to acknowledge that, you know, we think that this is important to do, but we don't yet have a super strong evidence base about the quantitative return on investment we might be able to expect. We see it happening in other countries that spend more on social services than health than, than we do and less on healthcare than we do, that, um, that they have a healthier population, but it's a matter of documenting that here and pricing it and figuring out uh, what that connect the dot looks like. That is a perfect role for the Innovation Center, but it does, it does start to come into conflict a little bit with 
CMMI's current statutory authority, which is really focused on generating models with the potential to save or improve quality. Um, it's a question of how that's interpreted. It may also be a question of whether CMMI needs more statutory flexibility to really take that into account. Next slide. So then switching from talking about disparities to talking about um, multi-payer momentum, why is this important? Well, you know, if you're a clinical organization and Medicare is making a whole lot of noise, yes, you'll pay attention because that's 30% of your book of business. On the other hand, it's just 30% of your book of business. And that will limit the degree of risk that you're willing to take on and the degree to which you're really willing to actually change your underlying business model from one that generates volume to one that generates value. So that multi-payer momentum is really, really critical for giving a sense of inevitability, but also allowing the CFOs at these organizations to, you know, with to abandon the, the ambivalence they have currently about thinking about their investments in terms of generating value. Um, well, how do you do that? First of all, federal government is not just Medicare. And I think it's it's been easy for us to forget that. It's not easy to coordinate across departments, but Federal government finances a ton of healthcare through other means that could be much more coordinated in the way they approach value-based payment. I'm talking about the AA, sorry, ACA exchanges, about Tricare, FEHBP, even HRSA and ACL, which don't um, mostly don't pay directly for healthcare services. They have roles to play, especially in addressing social drivers of health and in terms of workforce issues for disadvantaged populations like rural areas. Um, there could be a lot more coordination across the federal health programs. And then secondly, it's important when you're thinking about engaging commercial payers in this work in partnership with, um, with public payers that you acknowledge their realities, okay? Um, Value-based payment contracting works differently in private markets. It's very difficult to, uh, to issue mandatory value-based payment contracts unless you are, e even sometimes if you are a local blues plan with 80% market share, it's difficult to make that mandatory. Why? Because um, there will always be providers in the vast majority of markets with must-have status. And you, you can't function as a health plan. You can't offer a plan network that doesn't include that major academic center or that major hospital system, which means that providers really have the upper hand for the most part. And so these value-based payment contracts, while they do exist and they continue to grow in the commercial markets, it's not uncommon for them to be held hostage to rate negotiations. So the same providers who are touting their value-based care credentials are also negotiating very aggressively for increases in their fee-for-service rates with private payers, such that in some cases that price growth can actually outstrip any savings they generate from lowering utilization. And so we want to be cognizant of dynamics like that when we do things at the federal level, like setting HHS goals for increasing the, percent, the percentage of spend from a private payer that flows through value-based payment contracts. Well, if you set that at 75%, that's telling the payer, well, if I want to meet that essentially you know, public relations goal, I have to be willing to pay whatever the provider wants in order to get them to be willing to sign this value-based payment contract. It also means that I may be signing value-based payment contracts with providers who are incapable of doing value-based care, and therefore I'm diluting the impact uh, of my own program. So you know, we have to be cognizant of the, the differences in these market dynamics when we make policy so that we're not sending counterproductive signals. And then lastly, I want to make a pitch for true collaboration. It is too reflexive for government to often say, here, we've designed this thing. Now, private payers, would you like to join us? That is not a collaboration. A collaboration is co-designing something with your partners. A collaboration is giving them agency in how they participate and the timing and acknowledging that they have operations to move, they have hardware and software to move and contracts to change that are at least as complicated as those that CMS have to move. Um, that doesn't always happen consistently. Um, I've seen it work and I've seen it not work. And I think that um, if 
if CMS is really serious about multi-payer collaboration, they have to make the investment in the relationships. Next. So um, I wanted to also dive a little bit deeper into some of those market dynamics and explain why it's often frustrating for me to listen to conversations that are binary, value-based payment works, value-based payment doesn't. First of all, you know, if we haven't fixed the underlying prices in fee-for-service, that's on us. That's not the, the fault of value-based payment models, but also because there's so many more dynamics that play into how effective a value-based payment program is. And one of those things is just the market leverage that um, a small but important number of large providers have. How does this work? Well, for one thing, it makes the status quo of volume-based payment much too attractive. They can garner very high rates commercially, and, um, and Medicare has done very little to make fee-for-service unattractive for them. So there's a ton of inertia. And you've seen that even through almost 18 months or more of the pandemic now, um, and with shut, intermittent shutdowns, there's still a ton of inertia. No one is divesting from bricks and mortar, even as they invest in more digital options. Why? Because there's this belief that healthcare prices won't go down ever, at least not for them, the most powerful providers. Um, and, and so they can continue to have to keep that as the backbone of their revenue engine is fee-for-service. And then these must-have providers have an, an awful lot of resistance um, to a lot of things that would make value-based payment more effective. What, and that's because they have the power of reputation, they're a big employer in whatever market they serve, and so they have huge political clout, they, have, um, they are a network provider, they are a must-have network provider, and they get those high revenues from uh, negotiated commercial prices. Well, those commercial prices are not siloed from impact in Medicare. They exert continual upward pressure on Medicare prices. Why? Because the providers can point to their high commercial prices and say, see, look, the delta between private and public is so huge, Medicare, you have to catch up. When in fact, it's an artificial delta because they negotiated those prices themselves at a price point that they liked. Um, and so because of these dynamics, they have very little incentive to participate in voluntary value-based payment models. They're sitting happy and high on the hog. And that incumbency, more generally, dampens competition. It means that um, new entrants, uh, new providers who have more efficient, lower cost operating models have a really hard time going to the marketplace. They can enter, but they almost inevitably end up having to partner with these big guys. And you thus dilute the impact that they could potentially have. For example, imagine, we don't have it yet, but imagine a group of providers that got together and said, you know what, we can offer a payer that a default for hospitalization is hospital in the home not in a big building with ginormous overhead, that we can offer virtual or on-site primary care that's digitally enabled, don't require offices for that either, that you know we're using a different staffing structure and our salaries are different and so on and so on and so on. It would be almost impossible for that organization to arrive in a marketplace and get the kind of patient volume they need. Why? Because the incumbents are so powerful. Next slide. So how can we, what, what does this look like to acknowledge these market dynamics in value-based payment models? Well, especially if, if it's CMS, there is the opportunity to execute on more mandatory models, especially ones that um, uh, have a particular focus on these high price, high cost providers and rapidly move them to downside risk. They can afford it, they can learn how to do it just like everybody else did. Um, they've just not been given the motivation. Uh, I won't talk about making fee-for-service less attractive here because that is a whole other hour and Michael and I can get quite agitated about that, but, um, but I will point out that there's also an opportunity to create explicit incentives for use of lower cost care models like virtual and in-home services um, and to favor those new market entrants for example, through beneficiary incentives to select them, through gen more generous financial benchmarks. I don't mean more generous that 
Medicare ends up losing money, but more generous than for regular ACOs. And also to um, offer population-based payments for bundles of lower cost services. So as Michael alluded to, may be problematic to offer to pay for telehealth fee for service ad infinitum, but perhaps to bundle things like you know, low effort telehealth plus um, primary care in the home plus et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, in, in an effective and efficient way. Um, so I, I think that's the end of my slides. I just wanted to um, tease you a little bit with this set of issues and um, encourage you to think beyond the, the pain of, of picture that is just Medicare. When Medicare makes decisions, they have broad ripple effects throughout the industry and vice versa. The industry's dynamics have ripple effects on Medicare and it's important to keep those dynamics in mind when designing value-based payment programs if we want to optimize how effective they are. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you so much, Mai, and I'm going to invite everybody else to um, come back on for some Q&A. We have about 15 minutes, and um, please go ahead and submit your questions if you're in the audience uh, through the the, um, the Q&A button, and we'll get those to you. Mai, you did a phenomenal job sort of bringing us into some of the reality of like moving from the vision of value-based payment to how it, it actually um, impacts the delivery system and what all of those different dynamics um, look like. And what I wanted to do is open up to um, Michael and Jennifer to um, also um, ask if you have any comments about, you know, like we kind of sometimes use these terms interchangeably, like payment reform, value-based payment, value-based care, delivery system reform. And like, do you have a comment on how do you make sort of the, the idea, you know, into a, a reality and, and like what what have you seen works and what doesn't? Michael, do you want to start? That's a broad question. I'm not sure how much you want me to talk about the terms, but um, I'll say quickly, I'm not a huge fan of the term value-based payment for a range of reasons. I do think there's a value component and a quality component. I think most of what's going on in uh, this space um, is alternative payment models that allow more flexibility and more control for the delivery system. So I prefer the term alternative payment models. Of course, that incorporates a value component, a quality measure component. I think that matters. In terms of what I think has been successful, and um, Jennifer went through some of the CMS results, I'll say something broader. Evaluations of these are extremely difficult. So it is important when you see the results, official or otherwise, to understand how they fit into context, particularly what the alternative comparison group was. Um, increasingly, there's a lot of alternative payment in the control group, so you're comparing the treatment group to models that have some alternative payment in them. But that part aside, I think the evidence on um, population-based payment models, think ACOs, is broadly positive, although not overwhelming in magnitude. And I think we can do a lot better on the population-based payment side in terms of program design. But I think by and large, my joke has been if someone promises you a dollar and gives you a dime, take the dime. Um, hopefully it will grow. Um, I think, uh, again, as uh, Jennifer mentioned, there's been a lot of success in some of the episode-based payment models, but you have to understand it very much depends on the episode. So making a statement like BPCIA works is a fine statement to make, but um, understand that that is not necessarily uniform across all of the episodes. Um, and so understanding the details of that matter. I, I think the advanced primary care models are unbelievably important because of the importance of primary care writ large, but I think the general results for those models have been less uh, successful in a macro sense and then there's a ton, I won't go through all of them, I will call much more targeted models around specific conditions, for example. And one of the challenges of harmonization is how those specific condition models fit in with broader population-based models. And that, I think, really gets to the heart of some of the themes of harmonization that I talked to earlier. Thank, thanks, Michael. And by the way, for those in the audience who are pretty new to the, all of these terms, um, the Alliance has some resources that are on our website, um, including some glossaries and um, some other uh, other resources that might be helpful to you. So, Jennifer, I mean, as you looked, you know, to these four models that, you know, what what worked? You mentioned risk. Like, what were some of the core elements of 
models that worked? Were there any common ele elements in common um, or, you know, did they sort of differ by model? Um, that's a really good point. And I think the finding that uh, mandatory risk and two-sided risk and our mandatory participation in two-sided risk um, poses some sort of advantage to increasing the likelihood of a model being found successful is sort of somewhat of a newer finding. And some of the elements included in the four models that have been approved so far um, really don't incorporate some of the more recent lessons. So all four models are really different and they did not all require mandatory. They definitely didn't all require two-sided risk. Um, so that just goes to show CMMI has a lot of characteristics and ideas to work through. And right now we know some of the things that seem to tend to work better, but we don't have a perfect recipe saying, these are the things we've tried and we've ruled them out completely. And these are the things we are just gonna keep replicating in every model. Yeah, and, and Mai, you mentioned, you know, mandatory participation in the models. Michael, you were, um, you know, not sort of advocating necessarily one or the other. I mean, this wouldn't be America if we didn't have a conversation about mandatory versus voluntary. Like, how can you give us a sense, that, you know, especially for those who are newer, like, what does that look like? What is at stake for these, um, you know, whether it be bigger health systems or smaller providers, like what are the different considerations that, um, that policymakers are um, thinking about and contemplating as they think about mandatory versus voluntary? Yeah, so th this is where I share that I, I walk around with a taxonomy of providers in my head. In my head, they, they fall into at least five categories and then there's one that, that or four categories and there's, there's one cross-cutting issue that sits on top. One, you've got the true believers, right? The, the organizations that are going to do, they've been doing value-based care since before there were ACOs, and they don't know any other way to live. I would put Montefiore in, into that bucket. Then you've got um, the uh, early adopters who are venturesome. They'll, they'll try it, but they're extremely empirical. They'll try it, and they'll do it for as long as it works. As soon as it stops working for them financially, they'll stop. I would put my older pulmonologist brother into that bucket, right? And, and I would put a, a good number of ACOs into that bucket as well. Then there are the laggards. They're less adventuresome, but if they see their peers doing it and they see that their peers are doing okay, they'll gingerly step in. They're not unwilling, they're just more cautious by nature. And then you've got the never evers, right? The, the, that, that is the group where I think um, many of the must-have providers sit. Now, you've got some, also got some must-have providers who are early adopters. They want that reputational lift of looking like an early adopter, but underneath, they're paddling like a duck really, really hard on fee-for-service. So it's all a wash, right? Um, those are at least some of the taxonomies, and I think that policy can't treat providers with a one-size-fits-all approach. Right. For true believers, early adopters, you can off you can afford to offer um, somewhat more generous financial terms because they're the market leaders. They are the ones that everyone else is watching. If they fail, you will lose a lot of momentum. Right. For the laggards, maybe you need you know a different set of incentives and a gentle nudge, um, like macro or QPP or whatever. But for those laggards. I, I don't see anything moving them except mandatory models. And so while politically, it, we can argue about whether it's politically harder or easier to target mandatory models at a subset of providers, um, you know, operationally speaking, those are the ones who need the mandatory models the most if they are to be a constructive part of this care delivery system. Having said all that, I also want to make a point with regards to, and this ties to your question about what's worked and what's not is, I think sometimes we forget that we don't need to get savings from every part of the care delivery system. I think sometimes we forget that there are parts of the care delivery system that we have grossly underinvested in. And those parts of the care delivery system, we should not be trying to get savings from. And there, there's not a lot of room in the Innovation Center's statute right now that allows it the flexibility to make those types of changes. This is why I think the advanced primary care models have not done as well on paper, because that is not a piece of the delivery system that we should be trying to get net savings from. We actually need to invest more in primary care. Right. And I, I would put rural health care in that bucket as well. So I, I think we need to 
take a step back and not think of these bits of the system as in silos, but rather what is this, the overall system that we need, where are the net investments, where are the net savings to come from, um, and be more deliberate in that sense and not hold every part of the system to the same standard. Thank you. And we did have a Twitter question come in about whether CMMI would need, um, you know, new statutory authority to um, better incorporate social determinants of health. And I think you you touched on that in your presentation. And, uh, you know, I, I guess it sounds like the answer is maybe. <laughs> um, is that? I, I think they do. I think I, I think the Office of General Counsel is always very nervous about um, allowing CMMI to waive that part of the Social Security Act that says Medicare will make payments only for clinical services. Um, that's a very touchy piece of, of statute for them to waive. Um, and, and I think also, you know, um, giving that flexibility, more explicit flexibility to spend Medicare dollars on that is, is the thing. But they also need flexibility. Maybe I, I completely understand why legislators would want CMMI geared toward generating savings. But maybe they don't need to spend all of their money doing that. Maybe there's a portion of their appropriation that can be spent on making net new investments or on just you know, building other system infrastructure that would facilitate the generation of savings in other models, like better risk adjustment, for example. Um, so I, I do think that, that there could be opportunity to revisit some of the statute. Great. Th thanks, Mai. And Michael, you had wanted to weigh in, and I also wanted to ask you this audience question, which was around, you know, do, how much, um, if at all, do you think the um, APMs that are being tested will play a role in extending, um, you know, the solvency of the party trust fund? Um, what, what, if any, impact do you think that'll have? And um, I recognize, too, we're, we're coming up on one o'clock, and um, we're, we're going to stop right at one. Um, so um, if you could uh, briefly comment on that, we'd appreciate that. The trust fund is a, a challenging issue because it's only one part of Medicare. But to the broader question of solving Medicare's problem, understand that while there's a lot of pricing improvements we can do in Medicare, that at big picture, Medicare has an efficiency problem, not a pricing problem. Prices are set to rise below inflation. And so finding uh, solutions will require finding efficiencies. That's going to be some version of things we do in Medicare Advantage and other changes we make in the Medicare traditional model to get efficiencies. I believe APMs are an important part of that, but we have a ways to go to define the right APMs. Great. Th thank you so much. And uh, Jennifer, let me turn the final question to you. You know, we've talked a lot about the different goals, right, of value-based payment, whether it be um, increasing affordability, you know, slowing spending, inc improving quality, advancing equity. Um, as you have studied um, the breadth of these models, do you think there are any um, existing or like new ideas that can help to achieve all three of those goals um, w within the construct? And I mean, I know that's a huge question, but um, do, you, do you have thoughts about how to, how, um, how policymakers, practitioners could think about um, addressing all of those? Kind of a, you know, we talk, used to talk about the triple aim, then the quadruple aim with clinician burnout. Now it's like, you know, bringing the equity component in as well. Thoughts on that? Yes, I do actually, um, and I want to note, you know, uh, I think someone in the question raised the issue of all the acronyms and the and the lexicon that we're using, very high level, and yet underneath all of these elements, quality of care and accountable care and and, and payment savings, um, there's so many nuances and ideas. And when you go look at what's happening at the innovation center, each of these models is subject to an independent evaluation where an outside group comes in compares what happens in the CMMI model compared to some control groups. And there's hundreds, there's thousands of pages of tremendous details. So we're not just saying quality improved, but they're talking about what really improved for beneficiaries' lives. Did they not have to go back to the hospital a second time? Were they able to stay in their long-term care facility and now bounce back and forth? So there's lots of elements of quality. Um, addressing equity and, and social determinants of health is a newer idea. Um, incoming leadership has signaled their commitment to it. I would expect to see this start showing up in all sorts of elements for models. Um, provider selection, beneficiary attribution, measures, um, and then eventually it's going to start showing up in the evaluation and the great detailed information we have about all of these aspects of models. So 
policymakers just hopefully need a little help digesting that, putting up some high level lexicon and, and terminology. Um, and I, I expect really interesting, great things from those. Great. Thank you so much. So unfortunately, we're running up to the end of our time. I think we could go another hour to three hours um, with questions. Um, we've got some great audience questions, and I would encourage you um, to the extent you have specific questions for our panelists. Um, you know, they've graciously shared their, their contact information on our expert list. There are other experts out there that you can contact as well as on our resource list. Feel free to reach out to the Alliance, too, um, if we can be helpful. Um, so once again, thank you so much, Dr. My Fam, Dr. Michael Chernu, to Jennifer Pud for a, a really enlightening and um, comprehensive conversation. Uh, I think this is just the beginning uh, of, of uh, many more. Um, thanks to Arnold Ventures for your support. And please, um, if you're in our audience, go ahead and fill out that evaluation survey. Uh, quality matters and it matters uh, to us. And we use your um, input on uh, planning our future programming. So with that, uh, I want to thank everybody for joining us. Please join us September 15th and 16th for our Health Equity Summit. We have a really exciting lineup, um, including um, Administrator Brooks LaShore, who will be joining um, for, for a fireside chat uh, with us. So um, join us for that. And uh, with that, hope everyone has a great afternoon or uh, rest of your morning if you're on the West Coast. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Bye-bye.